What's going on guys? Matthew Minis here. Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to discuss JEPQ or JEPQ, which is a brand new, just over a month old income ETF offered by JP Morgan. Now, if you've been following my channel for some time, we've done videos in the past on a different JP Morgan income ETF called JEPI or JEPI. And to say that that one's pretty popular would be an understatement. So this video is gonna go over how do I think that this new variant is gonna do moving forward? Is it gonna be better than JEPI? Is it gonna replace other income ETFs that everyone loves like Q yield or R yield? What are the risks associated with this investment? What does it do right? What does it do wrong? We're gonna cover it all. Let's find out. Now, before we get into the video, I do have to disclose that I'm not a financial advisor. This video is just my opinion. It's up to you guys to do your own research and use that to decide what's best for you and your family. And also, we all know that time is money, and I don't want to waste anyone's time. And if you want the quick TLDW or too long didn't watch for YouTube, and that is that JEPQ is almost the same thing as JEPI, except instead of using large cap value stocks, it holds large cap growth stocks. So you're going to see a little bit more volatility, which in turn is probably going to provide a little bit higher of a dividend. And at the end of the day, the results should be pretty similar. But hopefully you stick around because we're going to go a lot deeper than that. So first things first, what exactly is JEPQ? Well, JEPQ is the JP Morgan NASDAQ Equity Premium Income ETF. It's designed to provide current income while maintaining prospects for capital appreciation. So theoretically, it addresses the major concern with income ETFs like Q yield and R yield, and that is, is that it doesn't allow for bull market rallies or capital appreciation. Now, the fund has three goals that are a part of the strategy. The first one is that it's gonna provide income by selling options and investing in large cap growth stocks so they're gonna pay out those monthly dividends that us income investors are accustomed to. The second goal is that it wants to deliver similar returns to the NASDAQ 100 index, but be a little bit less volatile. Now this can be good or bad because technically less volatility means that you're not gonna get as much upward trajectory as well. But at the same time, the good thing about less volatility means not as much downside. And the last part of the strategy is it's actively managed and three fund managers are doing what they can to maximize your returns while still minimizing your total risk. So from the outside, that strategy is pretty sound. I like what I'm seeing so far. And to be honest, if you watch my other videos, I'm not the biggest fan of JEPI, but I could tell you already that I do like JEPQ more than JEPI. So let's take a look at this fund. So a few key things to point out. The first one is obviously gonna be an expense ratio. Expenses are really important. We're at 0.35%, which for income ETFs is on the low end. When you look at something like Q yield, you're looking at a $60 out of a $10,000 investment. This one, you're only looking at $35, so almost half. The next thing that's really important is that the fund was created in May of 2022. So this is very new and there's not much history. So we can't actually look at how the fund's been performing. We only have two dividends that have been paid out so far. And we also haven't had that much time for this fund to be involved in a lot of different market conditions. So all it's seen is basically downside because we know that since November of 2021, everything's been going down slowly, but surely. Let's take a look at the holdings. Now we can download all the holdings and go through them all, but that's kind of a waste of time. Basically, it follows the NASDAQ 100 and invests in a lot of the companies that are in the NASDAQ 100. And obviously the heaviest weight are gonna be those major tech companies we're all familiar with. Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Facebook, which is now called Meta, Tesla, Maesla, and these NDX, these make up 20% of the portfolio, and those are equity-linked notes. That's how they do their covered call options that they sell on a monthly basis. Now, when we go to the dividends, we've had a 37 cent and a 33 cent. So on average, 35 cent, and if we take 35 cents and divide it by the most recent price, which is 46 bucks, you're gonna end up with around 9%. But Using two months, that doesn't mean anything. So we're gonna have to see how this does over time. So we know that the fund keeps 80% of its assets invested in equity securities. And that's what allows for that capital appreciation. For instance, if the market is seeing a rally, companies like Google and Facebook, they're gonna go up and our portfolio that is holding JetQ is gonna go up as well. That's 80%. The other 20% are the ELNs or the equity linked notes. Now inside those ELNs, the fund managers are selling covered call options that generate premiums. And that's how the investors are receiving monthly dividends or the income that they're seeking with this fund. It's the same thing as with its brother fund, JEPI. But there are some risks associated with this fund. And if you go to the prospectus for this fund, it has a really detailed breakdown. So let's take a look at some of those. So we're looking at this prospectus, as I mentioned, there's a lot of risk. Now I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I do wanna cover a couple important ones. We have equity market risk and general market risk. And what those two basically are is, 
this fund is not immune to what's going on in the world around us. So for instance, if we have something like COVID-19 happen again, more than likely we're gonna see a dramatic drop off in the assets that this fund holds, which in turn is gonna bring JEPQ down as well. So just because our fund may seek less risk does not mean that it's immune to risks that are outside of the control of us. Our strategy risk. So the advisor may not be successful in managing the fund with a lower level of volatility than the benchmark. That's a really good point. Some people love passively managed funds. Some people like actively managed funds. At the end of the day, it's not a preference, but you really can't argue with the fact that it's very hard to time the market and do better than just the overall S&P 500. So at the end of the day, we might not be able to actually get better returns than if we had just put our money in the S&P 500. Now we have an ELN risk and a covered call options risk. And those basically talk about the major problem with income ETFs, which is we're gonna get premiums, but if there is a huge rally in the market, we're only gonna get those premiums and we're not gonna be able to capitalize on that growth because at the end of the day, we're only gonna collect the premiums and then we're gonna to have to sell off our shares. We would get more money if we had allowed our assets to grow as much as they did versus collecting that premium. But, you know, there is the opposite side where when the fund goes down, people are still buying call options, which is good for us. You have large cap company risk and small cap company risk, which basically goes, which basically goes to each side of less volatility and larger volatility. With large cap funds like Meta or Tesla, you're not gonna see huge swings when you have a trillion dollar market cap versus something that's in the billion dollars. It's just easier to move prices in those assets that don't have as many people invest and as much money in them. We have some industry concentration risk, some sector risk, and then obviously technology exposure risk. And at the end of the day, that's just what comes hand in hand with investing in the NASDAQ. If certain technologies don't work out, companies can go under. You know, we're investing in future advances in technology, hoping that it's gonna solve a problem with the consumer. The last thing we're gonna look at is a portfolio comparison or a back test of Q yield, QQQ, and QYLG. The reason I chose those is QYield is the income ETF that everybody knows about. QQQ is the NASDAQ 100. So we're gonna have a fund, QYield, that is 100% covered call options on the NASDAQ. We're gonna have the NASDAQ. And then the other fund, QYLG, is a little bit less known, but it's a 50% options and 50% growth. So it only writes covered calls on half of the portfolio. So even though they're not the exact same, I think we can find some small comparisons. So let's just take a look. So we're gonna compare those three, QYLG, QQQ, and QYield. We're gonna start in 2020, because that's when QYLG came out. We're gonna start with $35,000, and we are going to reinvest dividends. We're looking for the overall return here to see how these compare. So we're gonna scroll on down, and as you can see, QQQ in the red obviously went to the highest point because we know QYield writes 100% of the options, QYLG does 50%, so there's not gonna be as much capital appreciation. But when the market really started getting worse in April, May, and June, and even now, that's when this started to quickly turn around. QQQ has been falling off really fast, where Q yield is holding stronger, and QYLG, since it was a mixture of both, is actually in the lead. At the end of the day, our investments were actually ended the highest with the one that was 50% growth and then 50% of the income ETF. So my guess would be that JEPQ would follow closer to the red line all the way up to the top. It'd be probably a little bit higher than the blue. And then on the downside, it'd probably be very, very close. We'd probably have JEPQ finishing out in the top here. That's just an estimate. I could be wrong, but that's just my belief because you're gonna see the most capital appreciation with the actual index, but you're gonna see really strong dividends. We can see our dividends down here. 4,600 from QYLD, 5,900 from QYLG, and then here we obviously have a lot higher with QYLD and QYLG, but the reason for that is, is I actually had to look at this, but I guess in uh, December when there were those really large dividends paid out for the Global X ETFs, QYLG got a $3.21 per share dividend. That is insane. But it's normal dividend is only 15 cents a share. Crazy. So all in all, I personally like this fund. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna invest in it right away, but I think at some point in the future I'm going to. I like what it invests in. I like that it has a lower expense ratio than those big income ETFs. And I also like that it doesn't have the problem with the others, which is the capped growth. If JEPQ can be anywhere near as good as JEPB, e, I think we have a really good fund here moving forward. Now, even if we had history to go off of, we still wouldn't know how it's gonna do in the future. But if the fund holds true to its strategy and its objectives, I think it can be looking at a bright future.
So if you haven't already, make sure you smash the like button down below, subscribe to the channel. We do weekly videos on anything related to personal finance or fitness. Also, leave me a comment down below with your thoughts. I do my best to respond to every single comment on all my videos. And with that said, I hope to see you in the next one. Take care.